We are excited to be back for day two, and to kick us off this morning, we've got Christian Run. He is a project manager and researcher at the Global Challenges Foundation. He is also the CEO and co-founder of Normative IO, a software tool for measuring corporate sustainability. Christian has a background in mathematics, philosophy, computer science, and artificial intelligence. He is the founder of several NGOs and companies. Before he started Normative, he also worked at Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute. Please welcome to begin day two, Christian Run. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm glad to see that quite a few people made it here despite it being quite early. Um, and in the meantime, whilst we get this slideshow up and running, um, I want to tell you about you know, a misconception. So the title of this talk is Why Effective Altruists Should Care About Global Governance. So first of all, I want to clear up a misconception about global governance. A lot of people think that global governance is the same as world government, but it's, it's not the same. A world government is just a type of global governance, just as the UN is a type of global governance. So global governance is just a set of principles and institutions for governing global affairs. Um, all right, so... As I said before, the title of this talk is Why Effective Altruists Should Care About Global Governance. Um, so let's dive right in. So this talk will be based on um, a few premises. So, and it will have the form of an argument. So premise one, global catastrophic risk should be a top priority for effective altruism. Premise two, global governance is necessary for the mitigation of global catastrophic risks. Premise three, premise three, current global governance structures are inadequate for mitigating global catastrophic risks. And from that, the conclusion should follow that global governance should be a high priority within the effective altruism movement. So let's start with defining why, what global catastrophic risks are and why they are important. So, I mean, whatever you care most about, be it justice, knowledge, achievements, or family, it likely requires this planet. So conserving this world is a prerequisite for the continued existence of everything we know and fight for. So it's kind of obvious that it's important. So let's consider the three following scenarios. Scenario one. 100% of humanity is alive and well. Scenario two, a catastrophic risk a catastrophe kills 99% of the world's existing population. Scenario three, a, catast a catastrophe kills 100% of the world's existing population. So quick poll here. Um, do you think the biggest damage, difference in damage is between scenario one and two or between scenario two and three? So a quick show of hands. Who thinks the difference in damage is the biggest with, between scenario one and two? Okay, a few people. So who thinks the biggest difference is between scenario two and three? Okay, a lot more people. And personally, I would say that the biggest difference is between two and three, because in scenario three, um, we basically go extinct, and there is no recovery from going extinct. So we effectively destroy all future generations as well. So there is a couple of things that um, could destroy or damage human civilization and life on Earth. And some of those risks include uh, catastrophic climate change, nuclear war, natural pandemics, and emerging risks like artificial intelligence and, uh, and uh, yeah, engineered pandemics and, and so on. Uh, but there are also natural catastrophes like asteroid impacts or, or super volcanoes. And then, of course, there's a big set of unknown risks. So... That covered premise one, why global catastrophic risks are important. So now I'm going to give a brief history about global governance. So um, 
the first person who actually talked about, you know, global governance was a Greek, not very surprisingly. Uh, it was Diogenes. When people asked him, where are you from? He always replied, I'm a citizen of the world. And that was more than 2,000 years ago. And since then, not much happened on the global governance front for uh, 2,000 years until, boom, we had two world wars. And that kind of changed the situation. All of a sudden, after you know, the Second World War and First World War, a lot of people talked about you know, global governance, either world constitutions, unions, or even world governments. And in 1945, the United Nations was formed as a, a, a response to this movement. And one uh, you know, related uh, plan to, to the UN uh, that very few people actually know about is the Barouche plan. And the plan proposed to eliminate national armaments of atomic weapons and weapons of mass destructions and establish effective inspection and safeguards. And the United Nations actually signed on to this plan, which would effectively hand over all US nuclear weapons to the UN. And I mean, that's something that wouldn't happen today. So that t tells a lot about the excitement for global governance after the Second World War. But unfortunately, the Barouche plan never happened uh, because the Soviet Union had their own nuclear weapons program on the way, and they didn't sign the plan. Um, and after the UN, a lot of other global governance uh, institutions sprung up, like IMF, the World Bank, G7, European Union, the African Union, and the yeah, ASEAN countries, to, to name a few. Um, so the question here is, has global governance uh, been successful so far? And I would say the answer is that it has been successful on a lot of fronts. So for example, in, in the graph here, uh, it shows uh, the number of armed conflicts. As, as you can see from you know, uh, Second World War and, and Cold War, the number of armed conflicts have gone down drastically. And this, this data is fetched from uh, the Our World in Data project. And the same goes for global poverty. Uh, the proportion of people in absolute poverty has plummeted, which is really good. But I mean, the question is, has global governance reduced existential threats? Uh, and to a large extent, the answer is no. And in this part of the talk, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, and why global governance and risk governance has to become global. Um, so let's start with nuclear wars. So right now we have 14,000 nuclear warheads. And one single warhead war detonated on a large city would kill probably you know, around one million people. And we have 14,000 of them. And as few as a, ta a few thousand nukes could create a global nuclear winter, which would effectively block out the sun, destroy all crop yields, and potentially billions of people could die from this. So nuclear war would be something uh, very, very serious. Um, and the way, you know, nuclear weapons have been governed so far is through several, you know, treaties. One of those treaties are uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, that came onto effect and in, in the 1970s. Um, and uh, the treaty has been signed by most countries, and the, the treaty says that, you know, only five countries can have nuclear weapons and others can't. And those five countries are uh, China, France, Russia, the UK, and, and China. Uh, but since then, that treaty, um, four more countries have gotten nuclear weapons as well, uh, either by not signing the treaty or just ignoring the treaty. And those countries are uh, Pakistan, India, Israel, and lately North Korea. The thing is that uh, if you do, uh, you can either choose to, you know, arm your nuclear stockpiles, get more nuclear weapons, or disarm, 
And the dominant strategy, the way to dominate over your opponent, is always to arm the nuclear stockpiles. And from a pure, like, rational point perspective, that seems rational, but from a utilitarian perspective uh, and a consequentialist perspective, uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. But, I mean, unfortunately, uh, it is rational for regimes who want to preserve their own, you know, existence to uh, get nuclear weapons. And that's why the, you know, nuclear proliferation treaty hasn't really worked the way we uh, hoped that it would work. Yeah, I can take some questions in the meantime. Um, I mean, I, I would say emerging technologies in general and the governance of emerging technologies, because I mean, the same reasoning goes for any type of technology that could be weaponized, like lethal uh, autonomous weapon systems, artificial intelligence, like uh, general AI, uh, and, and also like bioweapons or, or nanoweapons. So there will always be kind of strong incentives for players on the international arena to get a hold of those weapons before the opponent does it. And that usually e leads to, you know, some kind of arms race. So the only way to prevent such an arms race, destructive arms race, because, I mean, it becomes more and more destructive as the technologies become more and more destructive. Um, and the only way to prevent it is to actually pay, pr change the payoff that, you know, players, international players, get from arming. And to change that payoff, you need uh, some type of, of global governance. It's okay, I already talked about this. And this is basically the, the payoff matrix why it might be, make sense for countries to actually arm themselves. Um, and I mean, as I said, the same thing applies for all types of emerging technologies, unless you can really change the payoffs that countries get from uh, developing those technologies. And the only way to do that is through increased governance. Because I mean, on the international arena, uh, it's a little bit of anarchy. I mean, you can't really uh, penalize, you know, countries enough for, for doing certain things if you don't have, you know, treaties in place and governance structures. Um, so this graph is kind of interesting um, because it shows that, you know, despite the nuclear non-proliferation treaty in the 70s, the nuclear stockpile went way up and almost doubled. And that's because all you need are two adversarial players uh, for the nuclear stockpile to grow. Uh, so it's first when you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and one player disappeared that the nuclear stockpiles began to disappear. Um, so to give you another example, um, let's consider climate change. So I mean, I, you know, a increase of T three degrees in the global temperature, most of Bangladesh and Floria would drown and major cities would be flooded. And it would increase the frequency of magnitude of extreme weather events and increase the number of climate refugees and, and so on, which is obviously bad. And we have a few you know, governance structures in place and a lot of climate treaties. We have the UN framework, um, Convention of Climate Change, we have the Kyoto Protocol, we have the Paris Agreement. Um, but yet again, we have the same type of, you know, game theoretical problems. So let's say we are, you know, we're the leaders of Nation A again. Uh, so if you look at the screens over there, let's say we're the leaders of Nation A and we play against Nation B. If we both do nothing, which is the default position, we might, you know, lose up to, let's say, hypothetically, 3% of our GDP uh, because of extreme uh, weather events and, uh, I mean, miscarriage of, of crops and so on. Um, and let's say we want to cut our emissions. So we're nation A, we can either do nothing or we can cut our emissions. The thing is that if we cut our emissions, that will have some costs for ec our economy because, I mean, fossil fuel is still cheaper in most parts of the world. 
So maybe we'll lose 4% instead of 3% uh, in, in our GDP. Um, so, I mean, because nothing will happen unless most countries agree to cut their carbon emissions, because otherwise there will still be carbon going up to the atmosphere. Um, but if we both choose to cut, you know, then we will probably be in a better situation where we might, you know, avoid uh, three degrees and only go up to two degrees uh, uh, in global uh, temperature. Uh, so, I mean, if we have a treaty that can do that, it kind of looks like it would be a stable equilibria, because, I mean, you know, if we both cut our emissions and get, say, you know, minus one in, you know, GDP loss for, for that effort, uh, then, you know, we shouldn't want to go back, uh, because then we would probably lose, uh, you know, even more because of, you know, the effects of climate change. But unfortunately, it's not that simple, um, because there can be a situation where everyone agrees to cut their emissions, but some countries might want to become free riders. They might think that, oh, it won't make a difference if I withdraw from you know, an agreement. It won't make a difference anyways. And I w might want to do it because you know, uh, coal or natural gas is cheaper. And this is actually what happened when Trump announced that the US would withdraw from the climate agreement. And he was citing these exact reasons. And yet again, you know, it seems rational from an you know, individual actor's perspective in the short term, but in the long term and from a consequentialist perspective, it doesn't make any sense at all. And we need global governance to prevent individual actors from bailing like that. So, I mean, let's kind of evaluate and see if the current global governance structure has worked when it comes to climate change. Well, I mean, fossil fuel still remains the largest energy source. And since, you know, the, the um, countries uh, and the UN started to think about climate change seriously in the 1990s, we have seen a 67% increase in greenhouse gases. And the US withdrawal from the climate agreement. And we're still not really safe from the long tail effects of climate change. Because, I mean, like, in the current scenario, we'll, we will most likely exceed, you know, uh, three degrees Celsius. But there is, like, this long tail in the probability distribution, where there is a, you know, 10% chance that we might, you know, reach six degrees Celsius, which might be, you know, catastrophic and lead to runaway uh, climate change, where, you know, the ice melts and methane gas is released. Um, so, I mean, in summary, uh, I think I've showed that, you know, we should care about global catastrophic risks. And I think I've shown to you that, you know, uh, global governance is necessary for mitigating those risks. And therefore, the conclusion should be that, you know, as the ineffective of altruism movement, we should care more about global catastrophic risks. Uh, which brings us to the last part, what we are doing about, you know, global governance and global catastrophic risks at the Global Challenges Foundation. Uh, so the foundation was uh, founded by this guy, uh, Laszlo. He was is Swedish, Sweden's most successful uh, investor throughout, yeah, of all time. He donated all of the money into the Global Challenges Foundation to reduce catastrophic risks. Um, and right now, at this moment, we're actually running a competition where we invite people from the public all across the world uh, to come up with ideas for how global governance can be reformed. And it's a $5 million prize competition. So let's play the video. The shape of a system will always determine the outcomes it achieves. The shape of our global governance system was decided after the Second World War, when the world was very different. Is it the right shape to tackle climate change and extreme poverty and global conflict? These challenges are global, not national. The way the world works together will dictate how we tackle them. 
It's time to explore new forms of global cooperation to future-proof our world. Humanity needs new minds, new voices, new ways, a new shape. Take part in the New Shape Prize. Help us reshape the future. All right. Thank you very much. So, so far, uh, the competition has gained a lot of traction. Uh, we have 12,871 proposals as of today from 186 countries. And uh, 22 organizations have held local events uh, about how to reform global governance. Some of those organizations are the Brookings Institute, Chatham House, the University of Oxford. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're doing pretty well. So, how can you help? And this is my last slide. I'm, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, what you can do is that you can talk to me afterwards during office hours. Uh, I will have a table over there with uh, a bunch of our yearly risk reports. You will all, you know, be able to take one report for free and learn more about global governance and especially governance of global catastrophic risks. Um, so talk to me afterwards uh, or email my, my colleague, and she, uh, Karen. She's the director of the um, Global Chal uh, Challenges Foundation. She couldn't be here today, uh, unfortunately, but she's also an EA. So, I mean, especially if you're a leader within the EA community and a non-cis male leader, um, please contact us. Um, and yeah, you can participate in the contest or, you know, contact us if you want to organize a local event yourself. So, uh, thank you very much. And I would actually like to end with a quote, a quote from a famous uh, American poet and hip-hop artist that, you know, you shouldn't hate the player, but you should hate the game. And that, that's from I Ice T. Um, and uh, that is very much true when it comes to global governance, because we need to change the game of global governance in order to survive in the long term. Thank you very much.